first learn to write iOS apps, we read the uh, Apple's documentation, the sample code, read some blog posts, and we're quickly introduced to the concept of model view controller. This is enforced not only in the uh, SDK, but also all the literature. Uh, you may not recognize this pattern behind me, but you might recognize this one where we kind of have a pretty good idea of what goes in the model. These are the, the domain entities and the important state about our application's objects. And in the view, this controls the rendering and the display logic, the layout, and the custom graphics uh, that correspond to how we want the information to be displayed. And everything else sort of maybe doesn't have a home. And if you, if you sort of see the world like this, where you have these three buckets, and I have a piece of code I need to write, and which bucket does it belong in? And uh, this worldview is somewhat problematic. What if I told you you could invent your own buckets? You could use object-oriented design principles or Swift's uh, protocol extension features to create uh, and extract new actors that have defined roles and responsibilities in order for you to move that code into a better home. Now, there's an endless amount of literature on the topic uh, that is well worth your study. But before we talk about dependency inversion principle or Liskov substitution principle, those things are all really important, but it's important to ask yourself, why do I want to avoid putting 3,000 lines of code in a view controller or the app delegate, for instance? And the answer for me is that I want to be able to ship great products. And in order for me to do that, I need to be able to get the software out of my hands and into either my client's hands or my customer's hands. And I need to be able to respond to their feedback. I need to be able to iterate. And ultimately, the changes that I make in my software are going to make it better. They're going to make it uh, more appropriate for the use case. So I need to be able to embrace change, because change is the only constant in software development. Unfortunately, my ability, our ability, to ship great products is often hindered by the weight of the complexity that we impose upon ourselves. Now, this leads, this complexity left unchecked over time can lead teams to say that it's actually probably easier to rewrite the software than it is to change it to adapt to new requirements. So how do we avoid this problem? How do we get better at extracting logic into new places in our code? There's plenty of uh, pieces of advice we could give each other for this, but I think the most important thing that I find in my work is to give each object a job, one job. You want to be like these guys from the movie Office Space, interrogating your objects. You want to be ruthless and diligent about asking your objects, what, what would you say you do here? What is your purpose? And if you don't have an answer for that, or if your answer is very nebulous and loosey-goosey, then maybe it's important, maybe it's a time for you to extract that into something else, right? You need to give yourself more buckets. If you do this, you'll have a much more organized project. Everything will have a home. It'll be easier to reason about pieces of your code, and it'll be a lot easier to change those pieces of a code when they don't apply anymore. So I want to take you through three scenarios. The first one is view layout and customization. And for that, we're going to build an example app. This is our design that we're going to go. And you can see this is like a profile view for a book enthusiast type uh, social application. It's got a profile at the top, the user's name, uh, some metrics about how they've used the application, and a couple of actions that we can do for this button. So as you see these designs that come from your designers, you probably are instantly looking about like dissecting how, how exactly are we going to make this work. Like for instance, this image, uh, this avatar has rounded corners, obviously, but it also has a shadow. So if you add clips to bounds for the image view, you have to have a wrapping view around that that applies the shadow. Uh, little details like that. So we start looking at uh, these things. We start breaking down all the different pieces of custom UI that we have to do for this. Drawing thin lines around our buttons here, a custom solid background color for our UI button, and some rounded corners, and a background color for those section views. So in order to customize that, or in order to satisfy this screen, we start opening up our storyboard. We start dragging in views. We add constraints. We've got a stack view. We've got a nested stack view to make those things uh, lay out the way we want to. But this doesn't look like our design, and so we need to add some outlets. So we add the outlets for all the views that we need to customize, and then we write a little tiny bit of code, and voila we have our finished application. So it's at this point where you really need to stop and consider that everything we just wrote is about 80-some lines. 
All of that was view layout customization. It was co configuring CR layers, uh, mask to bounds, corner radius, auto layout constraints. None of that stuff really belongs in our controller, does it? So let's extract some views. Let's put it in the view layer where it belongs. So I'm just going to dissect this into a, a few discrete pieces that we can use as building blocks uh, to build the screen. So I'm going to create a subclass of UI view for my profile avatar view, for the stat section view, for the action strip. And for this one, it actually makes sense for this to be somewhat more generic, more dynamic. What if I wanted three buttons in there instead of two? You could easily imagine just making it dynamic, where it draws the line in between each one of its subviews. And then our action strip button actually is a UI button subclass, which uh, for whatever reason, UI button doesn't have a uh, set background color for state, so you end up with this weird hacky uh, technique of making a one pixel UI image of the color you want and using that as the background image for the button. All that logic whoosh, neatly tucked into a UI button subclass. So what have we done? We've taken a whole lot of code that we wrote in our controllers and we've moved it over to smaller views. That gives us a smaller controller. Our controller actually has no code in it now. And it's ready to tackle the purpose of a controller, which is to respond to view events, user input, et cetera, and state changes in our model. We have simpler auto layout constraints because each one of those UI view subclasses really has a narrow focus. I'm only really concerned with the things that are contained within it. And then when we're building our larger uh, view, we can assemble the, the larger pieces. It makes it a lot easier to reason about auto layout constraints. We have easier reuse for each one of these views. So if I want to take that button and use it in another area of my application, it's already a subclass. If I want to take that profile uh, avatar view and use it in a table view cell, it's already a subclass. But we, we're free to reuse that. And we can actually leverage IB Designable to make the storyboard experience more closely match the runtime experience. So let's move over to another scenario here. This is view controller flow. So imagine we have a view controller that's embedded in a navigation controller. Say this is a list of content. And the user taps on a button in view controller A and wants to present view controller B. So we create an instance of B. B is going to need some dependencies, like the model we just tapped on, or you know, maybe a managed object context to use, or any number of dependencies that B needs to function. And A is going to have to pass that along. Then we turn around and tell our parent navigation controller to push this specific view controller, and the application is ready. That feature works. Again, it's at this point where you sort of need to stop and realize that A is really should be concerned with dealing with the list of the content and responding to the events that, the, that are being generated by the user. But if we look at the dependencies here, A is really dependent on the fact that it's embedded in a navigation controller. It knows about the context in which it's presented. It's a bit strange. It also needs to be able to create B, and so it has an implicit dependency on B's dependencies. And if you take this problem one step further, let's say we have another view controller C, which has different dependencies. A would need to carry along C's dependencies also. This problem gets really, really gross in your own code as you need to pass dependencies along the chain. So in order for us to fix this problem, we can take the, the flow and the, the ability to create this view controller and elevate that into a new object. This object will own the navigation controller. It will respond to events generated by A, and it will know how to create a B. So we'll have one place for our dependencies to live, and it will know how to create the view controllers that are needed, and it is in control of the flow. This object is often called the coordinator, and if you search for the coordinator pattern, you're going to find all kinds of literature and blog posts and talks on this topic sometimes also co called a flow controller. These things are actually really easy to write. It's just a simple class. We're going to create one and pass it a navigation controller that was presumably created by a uh, storyboard. And I want to have a weak reference, an indirect reference, from my view controller A to the coordinator. So I'm going to create a protocol for that. And the view controller is going to have a coordination delegate property. It's going to call a method on the coordinator uh, when the user pushes the button. So then we need to reach inside the navigation controller and grab that first view controller and cast it, strong cast it, as the list view controller and kind of plug our noses and, and squint and pretend we didn't actually write the code that's on the screen here. But it's OK. It's not that bad, right? We'll fix that. for. Uh, we'll leave it for now. 
Uh, and then we set our coordination delegate to self so that the view controller has an indirect reference to this view controller, uh, to, to this coordinator. And then we just need to implement that method. So now the, the user pushes the button, the coordinator gets control, can create the destination view controller and, and uh, do the appropriate uh, presentation for that. So by doing this, we've actually removed a whole lot of logic and control away from A, view controller A, and given it a new home. Now A is only concerned with the content. It's a lot simpler to write. It's a lot simpler to test, because in a test, all you would need to do is create a fake instance of that coordination delegate and assert that a method was called. That's, that's really easy to do. So I want to take that example a little bit farther into something a little bit more realistic. This is from a, a real application. I had a, a, like a root view controller that needed access to data that was available on the internet, also needed offline support. So instead of doing data access and networking in the view controller, I've created actors for those things. The data manager is going to talk to the API client. API client is in charge of, you know, knows how to talk to the API, authorize requests, and knows how to parse the JSON into response models. And then the data manager knows how to take those response models and, and create core data entities, diff them with the store, and that way I can provide an incremental update to my view controllers. So this worked pretty well. My view controller had a strong reference to a data manager. It worked. But then we decided to change the design of the application. Now I have a tab bar controller. And now I have three view controllers that all need data from that data manager. And they all need like pull to refresh behavior. So in this scenario, who's really in charge of, of the show? That first view controller shouldn't be in charge of the show. So it's at this point where we can introduce that coordinator pattern, give the dependencies to the coordinator. And now we just need to ha allow our view controllers to call a method when they do pull to refresh. So now we're presented with this challenge of, OK, how do I get that coordination delegate set? Because that first time we did it, we plugged our noses. It wasn't that clean. I heard some snickering back there. How do we get this in there cleanly? Because now I'm, I'm wrapped two layers deep. I would have to take the tab bar controller, view controller's array, and then force cast that to a navigation controller for each one of those, and then force cast force cast each one of those to the view controller that I know it is. And that code is hard for me to even say, let alone write. So we're not going to do that. We're going we're to use a better way. So I'm going to introduce a Swift protocol called coordinatable, which is just going to define that property. And since we can use default uh, protocol implementations for certain classes, I'm going to add this uh, uh, coordinatable protocol to our container view controllers. So I've got one for UI tab bar controller. This doesn't actually save the property anywhere. It just sort of does pass through to its children. So you can see at the bottom there, we are uh, filtering the view controllers in my view controllers away that also adopt that protocol. Now, the navigation controller code is almost identical. It's 99% the same, so I'm not going to show that. But I also did the same thing for navigation controller. So now, I've just given myself a much easier path to set those delegates on each one of these view controllers. I can uh, set the coordinator as the coordination delegate for the tab bar controller. It does the same for the navigation controller, which does the same for its first view controller. Easy peasy. Now I want to talk about extract view controller. Now, a long time ago, when we had a small iPhone, it was really easy to just sort of consider the fact that one screen was one view controller. But that's no longer true. And it's really important for us to get, uh, get this in our head that we can actually create many, many view controllers per, for one screen. So going back to this book reading application, I've filled out this bottom section with a, with a list of books. And if we just look at the responsibilities and the data that's associated with each, each part of this application, we've got this profile header. It's dealing with profile stats and two actions that the user might generate, sending a message and following a user. And then the bottom section needs a list of books and needs to be able to respond to what happens when the user pushes the, the taps on the row. So this, these two things have nothing to do with each other. Really, all we just need to do is coordinate the two, give them the data. So this is a perfect opportunity for us to take that out and split it into a uh, child view controller. This is really easy to do in storyboard and in code. So this does present a little bit of a challenge, though, because we have uh, those two actions, the send message and follow user, that are on this child view controller, which now is now one layer removed from the profile view controller. And who's really responsible for following a user or sending the message? That, that logic probably lives elsewhere, because we probably have other areas in the application that need to do the same thing. 
So we don't want to duplicate logic. So sometimes those events need to be bubbled up into another actor. So we're sort of stuck with this problem, where those, that view on the left there has some nested view controllers, and we need uh, something to be able to handle those. And when you pass along delegate upon delegate upon delegate for your child view controllers, it gets really, really tedious, especially if those view controllers in the middle of the chain don't have anything to do with that delegate protocol. So one thing we can do in this scenario is, is really sort of rethink the problem. And the problem that we had earlier with who is in charge of sync well, we really didn't have an answer to that before because each one of these view controllers can talk to the coordinator. But if we rethink this concept and really think that UI view controllers don't have to have any UI of their own, they can actually be in control of sequence and flow, we can change our app architecture to be wrapped around, say, an app controller. This concept can actually be applied many layers deep in your application. So in this situation, I have a single instance of that data manager, and so who is in charge of sync? The app controller is in charge of sync. It's obvious. And if I have an event that I need uh, that is generated by one of those child view controllers, I can actually leverage UIKit strengths here and uh, use UI Responder to have automatic event bubbling from the view hierarchy to the view hierarchy all the way up to the window. So to do this, we would just need to add an extension method on UI Responder, provide a default implementation, just passes that off to the next responder then our app controller can handle that event. So those are three ways that you can sort of rethink about your view controllers. Always remember that there's a place for code. And if the code you're writing doesn't belong in that area, it's worth thinking about where it does belong. I often see view controllers go out of control when people are doing rushed programming. They're making, trying to get things out the door really quickly. quickly and we never, ever get the time to go back and make it clean. I think this boils down to not having a clear definition of done. In agile software teams, you have to really list and agree upon what it means when something is done. When do I drag that card from in progress to complete? Is it when I finished writing the code, or I checked it into Git, or it's had a review, or I've, I've taken advantage of some low-hanging fruit refactoring opportunities, you'll never be given the, the, you know, the golden pass to go back and refactor your code to eliminate technical debt. It has to be a continuous effort. So expand your definition of done to include quality. So I think it's really important to give each object a job in order to give yourself more buckets so you can ship good software. Thank you. <laughs>